So thanks for joining us. This is going to be a, a, a session that's going to do a deep dive on the corporate practice of medicine. Uh, first, we're welcoming uh, Aaron Fusé-Brown, uh, JD MPH, and Hayden rook Lay, JD. They're the two lawyer co-authors of the recent New England Journal of Medicine article, uh, The Corporate Practice of Medicine, A Doctrine in Name Only, Strengthening Prohibitions on the Corporate Practice of Medicine. This was published midway through while we were writing our working paper. Um, and, and this is something we're starting to see is that it wasn't just us calling for it. There's policymakers and lawyers, even if um, they, you know, depending on what you think lawyers think of us, everybody's starting to see that this corporate practice is a problem uh, for society and patients and that it can be used as a tool to fight financialization of the healthcare system overall. So uh, without further ado, um, Aaron Fuse brown a Georgia State law professor, and Hayden rook Lay, a uh, lawyer who spent five years Capitol Hill as a health policy staffer also, uh, the co-authors of the New England Journal article. Thank you. Thanks, Mitch. Uh, great to be here. And so I'm just gonna kick it off by just talking a little bit about I mean, I think I don't need to educate this audience about the corporate practice of medicine, but we're going to do the deep dive just so that we can understand um, what the next steps are, because Hayden and I are also advising um, the state of Oregon on a, a bill moving through the legislature right now that would strengthen the corporate practice of medicine prohibition. And also, we are going to subsequently be working with the National Academy for State Health Policy to develop a national model law for states to not just strengthen the corporate practice of medicine, doctrine, uh, prohibition, but also do other things that we're hearing about that will hopefully uh, help with the financialization, corporatization of uh, medicine. All right, so next. So the corporate practice of medicine doctrine, what is it? It sounds, you know, it's, it sounds anachronistic and it kind of is. Um, it basically boils down to a general pro prohibition for unlicensed lay entities, meaning unlicensed non-professionals from owning, employing, or controlling a medical practice. So this means that, you know, again, when it was started, it was just about banning the unlicensed practice of medicine. You know, people who are holding themselves out as physicians, but are not uh, necessarily possessing the training and expertise of a physician. It also dates back to this political um, starting aggregation of the movement of physicians as a profession um, to defend its sort of the autonomy and the um, educational sovereignty of the profession back in the 1800s. And it was rooted in this concern, not just that hucksters were going to hold themselves out as physicians, but also that corporations are going to come in and invest, employ, and control physicians um, and the tension between that form of um, insurance and other types of payment and Physicians, sorry, this is going in and out. Um, so a lot of these bans then were really kind of put into place back in a time that is not anything like the way medicine is practiced today. And that, that has been a problem in the sense that it is something that exists in sort of in legal form. People are like, is it, does it still exist or is it gone? And the answer is no, it's still on the books. Um, but it's on the books in this way that hasn't been enforced or used in, a, in quite some time. Um, it does stem from this concern about the unlicensed practice of medicine. But you also, if you're a lawyer and you're looking for where is my state's corporate practice of medicine prohibition, you can't just like look it up. It may not be enshrined in statute. It may be the result of a series of cases by judges and case opinions. It could be an attorney general opinion or a medical board opinion. So it might stem from something as, as basic as you know your statute says there shall be no unlicensed practice of medicine in our state and then subsequently the attorney general or the medical board or some case some judge has interpreted that to mean corporations can't control employ um, physician practices all right next slide so if we have these laws on the books in 30 plus states um, why is it that we have seen this wave of investment of corporate ownership control or contractual control over the physician market. And we have seen it. So that was sort of the basis. That was our jumping off point question um, for this New England Journal article, which was basically, 
we have this wave of consolidation and corporatization, and we have all of these state laws on the books, some are stronger than others. Why have, have these laws designed, I think, to stop this particular threat? Why haven't they stopped all this investment? And the reason is that there has been a series of erosions over the years since a lot of these corporate practice prohibitions were put into effect that have essentially undermined their effectiveness. So the first is that the corporate structure usually refers only to the, the restrictions that require either all or a majority of the owners of a medical practice to be physicians is often in state law limited to professional corporations. But there's no similar requirement to organizing as an LLC or an LLP. And that means that there's just this like workaround, right? You can organize as an LLC or an LLP and anyone can be an owner of those and still practice medicine. Another type of erosion is the ad addition of ex broad exceptions over the years, particularly as we've seen integration, clinical integration, um, the rise of managed care, there was sort of this need, to, this view that the corporate practice of medicine was designed for an old era of, you know, the, the sort of era of physician practices, and that it didn't have a place in the modern, new, innovative way that medicine is practiced, especially in the 80s and 90s, with the rise of managed care, right? And this sort of integration of the payer and the management of healthcare services, it was seen that there needed to be broad exceptions for hospitals who were increasingly um, employing physicians. Uh, also other types of facilities and managed care companies. And then finally, and I think this is the biggest one and probably the one that's probably most responsible for the phenomenon that we see today is that lawyers are smart, right? They just figured out a way how to contract around the corporate practice of medicine doctrine. Um, and so what we see, and you, if you listen to sort of lawyers talk among themselves, they're always talking about how do we advise our clients um, to be able to, our physician clients or our uh, physician practices to basically partner with a private equity investor um, without while working around the corporate practice, making it compliant with the corporate practice of medicine. And what they do is they basically find a way to make it look like the professional corporation is still owned on paper by licensed physicians in the state, but all of the sort of revenue and the day-to-day -day operations is funneled through the management services company, which is really owned, operated, and controlled by the corporate investor. Next slide. So this brings us to the MSO model or the friendly PC model. Um, so this is the legal workaround. This is the strategy. And we saw this in the first session of the day. Um, so I won't go into it in a great amount of detail here, but basically the investor invests in a management services organization, which tells the world, holds itself out as providing back-end ancillary administrative services. We'll, and it markets itself to the physician saying, we'll take all of the, the sort of stuff you don't want to have to deal with, billing, collections, uh, scheduling. We'll just take that off of your concern. And you just, you just worry about treating patients, right? And that was the whole idea of the corporate practice of medicine is not to allow a corporation to interfere with the clinical decisions of a professional uh, licensed physician. And so this is saying, we'll take all the business administrative burden off your plate so you can focus on the clinical decisions and we won't interfere with your clinical decision-making. Another way this happens, and that's just done through contract, is the friendly PC model is a very aggressive version of the MSO model, where basically the friendly PC says the MSO, which is owned by a corporate entity, um, is gonna select the physician um, to be the licensed physician owner of the practice and everyone else is just employees. And the licensed physician owner of the practice gets to call the shots, but that person is also either on staff, on payroll or overlapping with, they're basically in the pocket of the MSO company, right? They're, the sa they're basically the same person. Um, and so that friendly PC gets to run the company, run the pr practice, basically according to the dictates of the uh, corporate entity without on paper violating the corporate practice of medicine. So what we find though, is that this sort of ancillary back, you know, back room administrative services starts to look a lot like running the practice, right? It is uh, requiring stock restriction agreements, purchasing all the practice assets, determining who will be the physicians and the clinical staff that are hired, determining their work schedules, determining their compensation, determining whether they're gonna be fired. Uh, dictating the volume of patient encounters, ratcheting it up even against the will of the physicians, uh, make coding decisions of how we are gonna code 
the encounters that we see, establishing the clinical standards and protocols. This starts to sound a lot like the interference with the clinical decision making, because all of this has the, um, the practical impact of affecting the day-to-day -day practice of medicine, and no one would know that better than the physician sitting um, here today. So with all of that, we said that this is the thing we need to target. If you're going to create a stronger corporate practice of medicine doctrine, you need to get around uh, this model. Next slide. And you need to have it be enforceable. So when, one thing we heard this morning was, well, if this exists, why isn't this enforced? Why can't we convince the attorney general to bring a case? Um, and I think that that part of it is that there's a lot, lack of transparency, that, that these contracts tend to be um, proprietary, right? They're they're non, they're non transparent. We don't know even when we, we hear a press release that Optum just, you know, now we're at 90,000 physicians. Well, we don't know which particular physicians unless they issue a press release. And so we don't have transparency into where these arrangements exist. Uh, there's lax and uncertain enforcement, right? Everyone's pointing at each other like, I don't know, is this the attorney general's job? Is this the medical board's job? The medical board says we do individual physician. Uh, disciplinary things, we don't do this sort of corporate investment stuff. And so everyone, it just goes unenforced. And then finally, there's like this, the contractual compliance, right? You have all of this sort of built up practice and expertise of, you know, lawyers advising their clients to basically, this is how you can make it look for all intents and purposes, like you comply with the corporate practice of medicine. And frankly, they do comply with the old corporate practice of medicine doctrine. So one of the things we consider is when you draft a model of, of figuring out a way to put enforcement in the hands, not just of the attorney general and over the, and the medical board or other administrative entity, but also allowing a private cause of action or explicitly calling for a private cause of action. So the people on the ground, right, the physicians, um, the employees who can see this all happening and unfolding in their practice can be basically private attorneys general and blow the whistle on these when they occur. Next slide. Um, I think I'm going to turn it over to Hayden now. Great. Thank you, uh, Aaron. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what's going on in Oregon because I think it's both emblematic of the erosion of the CPOM ban that Aaron just spoke about and because uh, we're amidst uh, a process right now of trying to strengthen the uh, Oregon CPOM ban to essentially address uh, certain types of corporate ownership and investment, particularly uh, private equity and non-hospital uh, non ownership. Think of, um, you know, Optum's been mentioned a few times. So um, a quick history on CPOM ban in Oregon. Um, so uh, in a Sizemore case in 1947, Oregon Supreme Court first articulated a ban on the corporate practice of medicine, similar to what Aaron just discussed, basically banning lay corporations from owning, controlling, or employing uh, physicians, um, but it's weakened over time. So we've seen express exemptions um, through the attorney general, um, actually a 1975 case, um, basically said, look, hospitals and other facilities, uh, we'll leave that up to sort of anyone to, to uh, interpret what we mean by facilities, are exempt from this ban. Um, this was the attorney general speaking in uh, and in Oregon, um, in contrast to, I think, California, as David might talk about, um, AGs, sort of these opinions are not thought to be binding. Uh, this is another area of like legal ambiguity when different, uh, you know, authorities speak, sort of how much is it actual like legal binding authority? Um, the AG uh, uh, issued this opinion, again, not the, not the Supreme Court or Court of Oregon, uh, but nonetheless, this has been thought of as an exemption in Oregon since then, um, that the CPOM ban wouldn't apply to hospitals, so therefore hospitals can employ physicians. Um, the other way uh, that we've seen erosion of the doctrine is through uh, sort of a combination of statute and uh, lower courts in Oregon. So uh, we had in 1995, a court of appeals opinion um, that said, uh, basically made a majority physician ownership rule, said that uh, it's not that lay entities can't have any stake in a physician practice, but it must be a minority stake. Um, but then after that, uh, the the uh, state legislature created this loophole that, that Aaron referenced around LLCs and LLPs. Um, 
whether it was intentional or not, it's not clear. Um, there was no sort of like legislative intent here that this is what we're trying to do with LLCs. It was a much, it wasn't a bill that was targeted towards medical practices, but nonetheless, um, it created this loophole for um, majority uh, or, or exclusive ownership uh, by lay corporations if you use the LLC or LLP model. Um, and then as Aaron mentioned, uh, perhaps most importantly, is this idea of the, the MSO or friendly PC contracting model. Next slide. So that's sort of context for what's happening in Oregon. Um, and then this slide, uh, and I'll go in, uh, apologies for toggling on the slides here. I was gonna kind of go back and forth. So hopefully this works out because uh, for a few of these, I wanna go into a little bit of depth. Um, we sort of uh, outlined here what kind of, what are the key questions and what would be the key provisions of uh, strengthening a CPOM ban uh, sort of for, for today's you know, healthcare world. Um, the first one um, would be to clarify you know, in statute, you know, the legislature of a state can just uh, clarify what we mean by a CPOM ban. Um, so this is uh, one of the provisions of what we're doing in Oregon. Um, this would be a, uh, again, just explaining in statute that this is the intent is that the 1947 ruling in Oregon means something and that there's a ban on corporate practice of medicine um, in the state. Um, and, uh, and then also uh, would clean up the loopholes, the express loopholes on uh, LLPs and LLCs saying, uh, like professional corporations, which are typically looked to as like regulating how medical practices um, have to operate from an ownership perspective, usually through some form of a medical practice act. Um, the provision in statute would say what we're requiring of professional corporations, typically that they're majority or exclusively physician owned, in Oregon, it's majority, a bunch of states, it's exclusive, um, you know, 100% ownership by physicians. Um, but the provision here is to bring LLCs, LLPs, um, and potentially other corporate forms in line with um, what's required of professional corporations. Um, and then, uh, you know, there are also questions around uh, express exemptions. Um, and this is where, uh, you know, the, the legislator who's introduced this bill, this session um, wants to maintain the exemption for hospitals. So in Oregon, the bill is, is not gonna address hospitals, um, but that's gonna be a key question in thinking about this legislation in any state. To what degree do we think uh, hospitals are corporate entities like other corporate entities that we might be concerned about. Um, they, and then you also need to think through all sorts of other types of providers. Um, so uh, we're very clear in Oregon that this statute does not apply to uh, public entities uh, providing healthcare. They are able to uh, employ physicians, whether county health departments, employing physicians to do uh, typically more public health oriented work, um, certain state agencies like correctional agency, um, you know, they employ physicians, um, and then uh, nonprofits that might be sort of contracted out uh, through, uh, you know, counties, think of, you know, nonprofits, community clinics, um, FQHCs, RHCs, so a lot, lot to think about in terms of um, what you might exempt in terms of uh, physician employment. Um, and then the third, uh, and I'll go into a little bit of depth here, is what do we actually mean by starting to regulate this friendly PC structure? Um, like what is that? Uh, so Aaron, Aaron talked about you essentially have um, a lot of, uh, of legal engineering here where the professional corporation uh, is essentially subordinated um, through contracting to um, the MSO. And what would it mean to like breathe life into uh, this idea that the professional corporation is actually the one in, uh, is the one in control? Um, so a couple of key provisions here. Um, and here's where I'll ask uh, to toggle. The first one is uh, restricting dual ownership um, and control of the PC and the MSO. Um, yeah, if you wanna jump ahead, yeah, this is the right one. So this is, this is um, one provision, one key provision of regulating the, the friendly PC structure is to say, look, if the, the problem we're concerned about is some you know, investor, technologist, whatever it's referred to, essentially creating a, uh, a healthcare business, um, if the model we're concerned about is that they're gonna identify um, a physician who's actually part of their, uh, their, their business, uh, might be their chief medical officer, if they're gonna identify that person who's part of their, uh, this company that they wanna start um, that's gonna be providing healthcare, and then not only use that CMO as you know, part of their business, but also as the owner, basically, of the professional corporation, 
So they'll take that CMO and use them as the owner of the professional corporation. That's what we're concerned about, which feels sort of de facto as you know the corporate practice of medicine. Then you could have a law here that creates a bright line between the two and says, if you are uh, an MSO, if you're the professional corporation is led by physicians, um, you can't also be a owner of the management services organization. And here we, you know, the, the specific language here is, um, well, you all, I, I don't need to read off the whole thing. Um, but, but the idea here is creating this, this bright line, prohibiting this dual ownership um, structure. Um, what we say in the Oregon bill is if the MSO is actually run by physicians, if it's majority owned by physicians, then um, you know, that would be permissible. Um, so this really, this, this really implicates the, uh, the PE model that has been discussed in a few of the different sessions where physicians often get minority equity as sort of an enticement. Um, here we're saying the professional corporation uh, has to be owned by different people, different physicians than the actual MSO, um, because the concern here is that the MSO is basically, um, you know, the most cynical version of this is just paying off the physician to be part of the, that business and then saying, and then being that sole owner of the PC. Um, if you want to go back, um, so that's one. Um, the other two is um, having broader language in terms of, of what we mean by the physician, the, the professional corporation actually having um, control over the practice. Um, and here, if you want to uh, slide, jump forward two slides, I think, um, here is where we really start to um, uh, outline what it means, not just to have control over medical decision making, but for all the reasons we discussed, where in modern medicine, um, the MSO is, ex is exercising control over the professional practice, um, even if they're not, you know, the ones who are diagnosing a patient. Again, the concern here is that there's a real sort of encroachment upon the, the exam room and the, actually how care is delivered. What you have to do then is broaden the scope of what we mean by a physician practice ownish, owning the professional corporation. And this is where we talk about um, essentially the professional corporation organized for the purpose of practicing medicine through all these different ways. So um, by you know uh, contracting or agreement or an arrangement um, in their laws and incorporate in their bylaws in their you know articles and corporations forming a subsidiary through any of those what that professional corporation cannot do is relinquish the exercise of direct indirect or otherwise de facto control of assets, business operations, or clinical practices or decisions. So much broader than just saying cannot relinquish control, cannot relinquish control of clinical decisions. That's a lot of the language that gets manipulated here. Because if you're an MSO um, or a lay owner, none of them are purporting to make a, a diagnostic decision. No one's, no one's saying that. Um, but for, again, for all these reasons where, you know, if a, a lay corporations, you know, the one in David will, can tell an anecdote potentially about this, you know, if they're, uh, if they have control over your total control of your schedule or, you know, how many patients you see, all these things that really influence the practice of medicine. So we want to have broad language here that really, um, you know, that really shows what we mean by, uh, you know, the professional corporation having control. Um, and then I'll go uh, one more point and then hand it over. Uh, if you want to go back, um, and then uh, with that umbrella range, with that uh, umbrella language talking about de facto control, um, also want to put in statute uh, the specific sorts of contracting practices um, that we're concerned about in a sort of uh, including but not limited to clause. So if you, last time we'll do this, if you want to jump forward three, okay, this is this will be the end of this uh, this game. Um, so again, after we, we define what we mean by um, de facto control over the medical practice, then listing a few specific practices that uh, are particularly concerning. Uh, stock transfer restriction agreements were mentioned earlier. This is the idea that essentially the MSO, the investor, has a say over how the physician owners uh, sell their shares. So it actually has to be, uh, it has to be approved by um, the medical practice, by the MSO, that sort of contracting arrangement um, is banned. Non-competes and gag clauses have been mentioned. Um, this is another way, of course, to uh, exercise control over the, the physicians. Um, and then a bunch of different practices that we lay out. Uh, I condense the language here. It's, it's much longer and, and much harder to understand. And statute tends to be how uh, actual legislation is. But 
you know, a, a few of the things I think Aaron mentioned. So hiring, firing, supervising staff. It's again, it's not that an MSO can't be used. It's not that a, a physician can't use a, a vendor to help them run their practice. The idea is that they have to retain the control over these practices. So they need to know, for example, we have, you know, coding, billing, and collection. Of course, the physician's not doing all those things. But the idea is that physicians have some understanding and supervision over what's being billed in their name. Are these practices taking, you know, whatever they write in their EMR um, and turning it into, you know, a level of coding and billing that just isn't commensurate, that isn't justifiable, or collections? What, um, you know, what are the practices that, the, that, the, that, you know, some lay owner might be taking to, you know, collect from patients? And do the physicians approve of that? Um, or, uh, you know, uh, the last one here, advertising. Is the MSO advertising in the name? Are they purporting, are they holding themselves out as actually practicing medicine as the MSO? Um, and we would, uh, you know, ban something in that sense, because again, the lines get blurred here when the MSO um, seems like, especially if it's a large recognizable name, uh, is that actually, you know, is that actually the, 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 the MSO or the practice, for example, uh, I referenced this earlier that Optum's acquisition of a practice in uh, in Oregon right now. Every you know, it's it's thought of to everybody as the Optum acquisition. Um, but really, what's happening here is that uh, you know one physician is being appointed as the sole owner of the practice, and Optum is just an MSO contracting with them. Um, but that needs to be clear to the patients and the public um, who actually owns the practice. Um, I think that's. I think I'll stop there. Uh, if you want to tick back. One more time. Yeah, and then the last the last part was just about enforcement. I think uh, Aaron touched on that. Um, thinking through, Oregon's a, a good example of the ambiguity in enforcement. If you ask the Attorney General, they'll say that the Oregon Medical Board enforces. If you ask the Oregon Medical Board, they'll say the Attorney General. It's very unclear um, who, if anybody, is monitoring this. For example, the, the uh, loopholes that exist now. The state has no idea whether physician practices are majority owned because none of this reporting happens. So like all of this sort of the muscles of atrophied around CPOM uh, bans, and that includes just the regulatory structure. So 